Welcome to The Cynical Developer, the podcast that helps you to improve your development knowledge and career through explaining the latest and greatest in development technology and providing you with what you need to succeed as a developer. In this episode, we talk to Peter Shore of Lidnook about HTML5 and Flexbox. Peter describes himself as a geek's geek. He started with computers when he was just seven years old, way back in the late 1970s. It's often cited that he's uh, got a CPU for a brain or he's some kind of biological computer. He's not happy unless he's building something, tinkering with code, or generally learning some new tech. He doesn't consider himself to be a developer, more of an all-round technologist who understands back-end and front-end code, hardware, and all the little bits in between. So welcome to uh, The Cynical Developer, Peter. Uh, thank you for having me. Not a problem. It's uh, it's good to have you back on, and uh, a little bit of uh, openness. I've worked with Peter in the uh, in the past, and that's how, uh, how we got to uh, know each other. So uh, we've both gone different ways now, and not worked again together uh, since. But uh, yeah, no, this is true, and yes, it was good fun times back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was all uh, all interesting stuff. It really was. I uh, got to do some uh, some some cool projects, but uh, things change and people move on, and we are where we are yep. today. We are indeed. So I mentioned Lignog there, um, and for the listeners that don't know what or who Lignog is, could you give us a bit of a background? Tell us what you what it is, what it's about. Yeah, certainly. So um, anybody who's got any familiarity with the LinkedIn social network these days will know that there is something called LinkedIn groups on there. Um, Lidnug is, I wouldn't say it's one of the biggest groups. We were at one time, um, but what we tend to be now is one of the cleanest groups. We don't have the sheer numbers in the user base that some of the other .NET groups on the LinkedIn platforms have, but a lot of the other groups that are on the LinkedIn platform are full of advertisers and recruiters that basically just want to spray the network with their latest and greatest revitalized blog post that they've copied from elsewhere. Sure. So Lidnug is, I would say, probably the cleanest and most vibrant of the .NET related groups on the LinkedIn social network. And we have some very, very interesting discussions going on. We do do live presentations. Um, if you go to youtube.com slash Lidnug, you'll find all the presentations we've done in the past on there. Uh, we do still do them occasionally, but not with the frequency that we used to. And we also have a presence on Facebook and Twitter and all the other usual places. We are essentially a virtual user group that spans the globe, as opposed to just your regular sort of user group, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. not uh, not not a local one, but uh, but an online one for, for everybody everywhere. Well, at last count, we had... I think it was about 52,000 users worldwide. Nice. Not not too bad. Ca- catching me up on uh, one of my Facebook um, groups. I admin uh, a group on there for Tropical Fish, and I think we're just over 60,000 people. And that yeah. is a pain in the backside to uh, <laughs> to, to admin. We've, we haven't got a massive admin team. I think there's probably about six or seven admins and then a couple of moderators now that they've put that in there. Yeah, it, it's very similar to Lidnug. Lidnug has 10 people uh, around the UK, uh, around the UK, sorry, around the globe. Um, we have some guys in Australia. We have someone in India. We have three or four over in the States. We have a couple here in the UK, and we have a couple on uh, Europa. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah. So oh. um, we, we do generally have a presence at, at some point in the time spectrum. Yeah, and uh, it definitely is one of the cleaner ones, and uh, a lot of the spam that goes on there gets cleaned out. I've had my wrist slapped before now because uh, yeah. I set up Hootsuite to uh, to broadcast out to my social <laughs> networks, and it picked up Lidnug, and yeah. uh, just spammed it, and uh, yeah. and I got a slap for that. So uh, yeah. it's definitely all it's all being moderated and being looked after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, we do that. I mean, we have a very, very, a, a very aggressive anti-spam policy, you know, and that's really it's it's that core belief in keeping the group for what it is and what it does 
that got us where we are and that our members certainly appreciate. Sure. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because a lot, a lot of groups out there now are uh, are dominated by recruiters and advertisers and yeah. and stuff like that, and it is very hard to find uh, information. And I yeah, would imagine I'm, I'm not very active with um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not very active with LinkedIn user groups and and things like that. But uh, I would imagine it probably follows the same ethos that uh, Facebook groups does, and that it's always presenting you with the the newest posts and the latest information. It's not yeah, like a, a forum. So if you if you have it full of spam and stuff, it's very very hard to actually keep up to date and keep yeah, track of what's absolutely, going on. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Cool. So we're actually here today to talk about HTML5 and Flexbox, um, rather than uh, just LinkedIn and, uh, and and complain about advertisers. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, I I could actually pick on LinkedIn about the state of their HTML5 and Flexbox layouts if you want me to, but Ooh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to resist the urge there, otherwise we'll definitely be here for more than the allotted time. Sure, sure, we might have to go on for uh, a three or four day episode and, uh, and, and carry on with it. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so we'll we'll dive in with uh, with HTML5 and uh, what is HTML5? So, well, HTML5, as the name suggests, is the latest incarnation of the HTML standard. Now, anybody who's been doing web development even for about ten years should be painfully familiar with at least HTML4. Uh, some of us who go back even further, like myself, um, remember the likes of HTML1, HTML2, and and the strange HTML3 that never even materialised. <laughs> um, HTML5 is the latest and the greatest version of that. However, it's more than just the latest, greatest version. It's a cleaned up version. So, if you think, think of HTML5 as somebody hitting the reset button on the HTML standard. Sure. Yeah? So, we've learned all these painful lessons. We've learned how not to do layout, how to do layout, how not to do typography, how to do typography. We've learned which CSS works, which CSS doesn't. Um, we've learned how to adapt things for different screen sizes, and we've looked hard at the types of APIs that people use, the types of APIs that people have polyfilled in to make things do what they needed to do. And more importantly, we've learned a hell of a lot from the type of stuff that people used to write in Flash. And we've now reached a situation in the grander scheme of creating apps in the browser that means we have this lovely API in the background that has all sorts of neat features in it that anybody who used to do HTML4 could only ever have dreamed of, especially if they didn't have flash or shockwave skills to do that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and it's now brought the browser to the front of everybody's attention and made it an actual viable contender as an application platform. Um, some of the lovely new features that HTML5 does, for example, is geolocation. So if you've got a GPS device, um, particularly if you've got a, like an Android mobile where there's a GPS device built into the actual phone itself, you can read that GPS device straight into the web page without needing any third-party add-ons. Uh, if you've got a device that has orientation on it, so you can tell which way up it is or what the level of the light is or a web camera and a microphone, you can record from the microphone directly into the web page. You can get the orientation directly into the web page and then obviously you can send that data back to the back end code or the website to process in whatever way your mind lets you imagine it also you've got things like um, improved 
rendering for animations. You've got new features to do some clever things with CSS, like uh, drop shadows, for example. I mean, I know you've done a lot of web development in the past because that was one of the projects that you and I worked on. And I know that you're painfully familiar with doing drop shadows in Photoshop. Yeah, 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 definitely. It's uh, not the not the nicest of, of things to have to do. Jump out and uh, and sort all that stuff out. Exactly. Well, you can now do that kind of thing directly in CSS level three, which also comes with the HTML five specification. One thing I would like to point out, though, is a lot of people look at HTML five and go, "Oh, HTML five with new CSS stuff," and it's actually two separate specifications. The CSS3 and the HTML5 specification are not joined into one specification anymore like they used to be. Right. And the CSS3, unlike HTML, doesn't mean that it's version 3 of the CSS standard. What it actually means is that's the third level of new features that have been added into the new CSS standard. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah. it gets very confusing. Um, if you've got half an hour to kill and you want to try and twist your brain into a couple of Gordian knots, then by all means, go and read the CSS specification page. Um, I hold no responsibility to what it does to your vision if you do, however. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, if you go online and, and you type in HTML5, if you Google Bing it or whatever, there's loads of examples on there that go, look at our HTML5 example. This is what you can do. And there's some stuff in there that's quite cool, like Doom and Quake that are running in the browser and that. Is that actually HTML5? Or is it, as I suspect, a couple of HTML5 elements and some just very nice JavaScript that's running it? <laughs> what you tend to find with a lot of it is it's actually the, um, the new bitmap tag. Do you right. know the the name the name canvas. escapes me the canvas that's the one it's it's actually the canvas tag because one one of the things that's been added to the new breed of HTML5 and conversely to the JavaScript engine that's in the browsers is the ability to do pixel level manipulation on a canvas yeah right. so you think if you think of a canvas as a writable bitmap mm -hmm. yeah. So it's just like an image tag, except you can draw on it however the hell you like. And because this thing is also designed to be used in a 3D fashion, so that you can write to it using OpenGL and GLES, um, what that then means is you actually have very, very, very fast frame buffer access to the canvas. Right. And that kind of speed... Even though it's in the browser and on fast modern hardware, gives you somewhere close to the type of speed that you used to get on the old slower MS DOS machines when you used to pour bits and bytes straight into the frame buffer for VGA mode, things like that. Right. Yeah. And because the canvas is a very, very linear object. Mm -hmm. in so much that the pixels are packed in a left-to-right horizontal fashion rather than any stupid sort of RGB stuff as Windows desktop users. You find that you can actually port a lot of these old DOS games literally by A, rewriting the C++ source code into JavaScript and then rewriting the VGA graphics libraries so that the peak and pork pixel methods just right to the canvas instead. Right. So it's uh, it's sort of bypassing it. You, it is sort of a port, but um, not not I mean, uh, not exactly as uh, as you would expect, I guess. No, I mean the, the the code is still JavaScript because that's the only thing that's yeah. going to run in the browser. Yeah, but it it is a bit of a cheat because you're not taking the pre-made graphics and rendering them like you would with HTML elements. Although you can do that. Um, there's a couple of games out there. Again, names escape me, but there are a couple of games out there that actually use the new perspective stuff. Um, there are new rules in CSS that allow you to draw things with perspective. 
Right. So that you, you've got sort of the vanishing point thing. And if you take a couple of divs and you move the perspective on one out to the left and one out to the right and then do the same with the top and the bottom, you can make it look as though you've got kind of 3D corridor kind of effect. All oh, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. you sort of take it back to uh, the the older 3D stuff that uh, yeah, the yeah. recent I, thing was absolutely, absolutely. amazing yeah. <laughs> um, back then. You, you know, and it well, it, it's very reminiscent of um, yeah, Rulia's, is it Rulia? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Something like that. It, it's very reminiscent of those kind of algorithms. Right. And because they're just divs, what you can then do is you can use your traditional CSS that puts something in the background of a div. So you as can, a background you can type. apply your uh, your skins to it with, uh, yeah. with CSS and backgrounds. Exactly, and there's your texturing. Right. So you can do this whole 3D thing just with CSS and HTML without ever touching any JavaScript. Yeah, you that's uh, it sounds quite cool. sounds quite and painful. Um, <laughs> and, well, it, it's not easy. I mean, obviously, you, you've got to you've got to know what you're doing. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's it's not like OpenGL. You you have to you have to do the maths yourself. You have to compute compute the the dot products and the vector transformations and all that muck. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? It's it's it, it's not for the faint of heart. If you're just a beginner to HTML and you're wanting to get into game development, then I've got one word for you. And that word is unity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? it, it's something I keep coming back to uh, and looking at uh, unity. Um, I've not really done any game development, but um, I've got an idea for a game that I want to want to build, and um, I built some of the mechanics just in yeah. in uh, in a console app. So yeah. the the start of the game actually just run in the background, but it's got new, no UI on it. And uh, whenever I look to sort of see what I can do with it, it always brings me back to to use Unity. Yeah. So I, when when I get a few uh, a few spare weeks, I think it'll be something I'll sit down and uh, and maybe try and uh, and learn. If you end up being anything like me, I've got. Um, in fact, you know, do you know what? I don't even want to try and count how many unfinished games I've got lying around <laughs> in my various project directories. You know, because I'll. I'll sit here, I'll have like a week off at Christmas or something, and I'll sit here and it'll be like, do you know what, I'm going to do a me project for me that I want to do. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I'll sit down and then inevitably family life will get in the road and and my family's like, um, no, you're home, you're off work, it's family <laughs> time. Yeah. You are not sitting in front of your computer like you do 24 hours a day any other time. Yeah, I know exactly how that is. I've got uh, shiny object syndrome, and I'm always chasing the uh, the next project. But uh-huh. uh, this one, I I do keep coming back to in my head. But um, yeah. it, it'd be to be honest, because it's only me. It'd probably be years before I get anywhere to even show anybody what it's about. Yeah, um, absolutely. But, but you never know. We might we might get there one day. <laughs> so indeed. Yeah. So we've talked about it being all these new features of HTML, is it supported by all the browsers or is it just certain browsers that uh, that support it? And do I need a browser that specifically supports HTML5 to be able to look at a HTML5 website? So, yes, you do need a HTML5 compatible browser. And by and large, most of the browsers, in fact, all of the browsers that are on the market at the moment do understand HTML5. Um, to kick your document into HTML5 mode, it's a simple case of just putting doc type HTML5 at the top as right. the document ref and then opening it with a HTML tag. There's none of this masses and masses and masses of XPath statements and yeah. you know all the rest of the stuff that HTML4 used to have in. Sure. The, so it's uh, yeah. it's got rid of all the, all those doc types yeah. and things at the top. It's simplified that down so you don't have to remember yeah. several different uh, ones for depending on what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, exactly. And all of the browsers that are on the market at the moment will respect that tag and that doc type if they see it. Now, as far as support goes, not all the browsers are equal. And this is actually a bit of a sore point for me because I believe that the industry as it stands at the moment is doing something very, very wrong. 
And that very, very wrong thing is thus. It's all right innovating and it's all right saying we're going to put this shiny new feature into the spec and that shiny new feature into the spec. But what's actually happening is there's still a browser arms race going on. Yeah. And the browser manufacturers are picking the nice, shiny things that they think are going to attract people to using their particular browser. Right. So they're concentrating on making that the biggest and the best. I'll, a perfect example is the audio and the video capabilities. Yeah. So when the audio and the video tags were first announced, Chrome, Google, didn't know how fast to get video and audio as supported tags into their browser. Yeah, They did this way before they did any of the other stuff. You know, mm -hmm. the, the CSS3 support was pants and a lot of the semantic tags were pants. Yeah. Now, the other browser manufacturers, namely Mozilla and Microsoft with IE, concentrated on getting the specification right. They concentrated on the whole semantic tags approach, the whole micro data approach yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And for Chrome... It was purely and simply the one thing that everybody was raving on about that everybody wanted was the audio and video facilities. So what happened? Everybody rushed to Chrome. Yeah. And, of course, this is what sparked it all off. So then Mozilla put the next greatest feature in and everybody jumped ship to Mozilla, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I'm probably going to get some hate mail for what I'm about to say. <laughs> but by and large, the only company that actually got it right, in my opinion, was Microsoft. Oh, oh dear. Oh, th th I think I might have to turn this uh, this, this recording <laughs> off right now. Oh, we can't, we can't be saying that. We can't, we can't be promoting um, Edge in, uh, and, and Internet Explorer. <laughs> well, well, basically, you see, what they did was <laughs> they ignored the hype. Right. She would have put the audio tags in. She would have put the video tags in. But they largely ignored the hype. They concentrated on making a stable platform, a platform for the future that you can build stuff on. Yeah. Yeah. And it took Mozilla and Chrome quite a bit of time to realize this. You know, I mean, as it stands now, at the moment, Chrome is probably the most, the platform that is that has most of the features implemented. Certainly, if you look at uh, sites such as caniuse.com, um, you'll see that most of the specifications are green lit all the way across for the Chrome browsers, not just on desktop, but on the mobile devices as well. And Chrome, modern Chrome has done a very, very good job of unifying the Chrome platform so that anything that works on desktop works on mobile as well you know yeah yeah there are still some holes in the specification though don't get me wrong but going back to what i was saying so so my grumble with the industry at the moment is what i believe we should be doing is we should be putting a halt on new features and new innovations and saying right we need to pause put the brakes on for about a year and all the browsers need to catch up yeah. Yeah. The the standards manufacturers need to turn around and say, right, by two thousand and whatever, Mozilla, Microsoft, Apple, Chrome, all need to have platforms where it doesn't matter which browser I use, I should be able to run a piece of code in one of those browsers without any hacks, without any polyfills, without any mix-ins or anything like that to, to fluff out the compatibility. And it should do it with a base level set of specifications that are clearly defined in the what W3 working group standards and clearly defined as being the minimum level platform. Yeah. Yeah, yeah? I, I, I can definitely understand the, uh, the argument for it. Um... But it's probably one of those things that's never never going to happen. Well, it's is it? it's okay. never going to happen. It is absolutely never going to happen because it's, well, it, it's a contest between them all, isn't it? Who's got the biggest and best browser? 
you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll we'll use browser as a as a fill in for the actual word that should go in there. By the way, I'm sure you know where I'm coming from on that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. But it it is just a gigantic contest between them all. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And, uh... and largely, the browser wars of HTML4 really haven't gone away. We just have a platform that works a lot better than it used to. Yeah. Yeah. And just to clear yeah. up for uh, for all of those non northerners in the UK and uh, and anybody outside of the UK, that um, the word pants means that it's uh, it's not rubbish uh, that it's rubbish that it's not any good. Um, <laughs> I just uh, throw that throw that in there to uh, to help people understand what we're talking about. It's bad enough that you've got this weird accent. You know, it's. Uh, we're, hey, <laughs> I can't help being a Geordie, like no. you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. All right, Pat, calm down. Right. Uh, <laughs> so. We'll have none of that Liverpoolian shite, mind. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, no, not 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 quite in Liverpool. Not quite in Liverpool. Over the water. Over the water. So, yeah. I mean, that that's my one biggest grumble, and I I really think that does need to change. And for the record, I'm not the only web developer that feels that. I mean, there's some quite prominent names in the game there's some quite high profile people um that have got way more of a following than i have um globally that feel the same should be done yeah you know yeah yeah. um but rightly or wrongly it's never going to happen and it's all about real estate you know because once they've got you on their platform then they're going to close the walls up and you're going to get locked to that platform, and then we're just going to be back in the big bad old days of vendor locking. Yeah, you know, and uh, the lo- lovely days of uh, Internet Explorer six, and uh, yeah, and, and so, before. <laughs> so, so to answer your question, yes, all the browsers largely do support HTML five, but there is still a lot of holes in there. Yeah, you know, um, they're not daft; they do realise that they need to plaster over them holes, but. It's a question of them pick and choosing which ones. Sure. Fortunately, the HTML5 developer community as a whole are very, very good at dealing with this stuff. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Especially the old hacks like myself that have been doing this for longer than we care to remember. We've we've seen it all with HTML4. So Unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you, you want to look at it, we are very, very, very good at coming up with solutions that solve this problem. Yeah, yeah. you know. So yeah. the, the po- poly filling those those holes that uh, that the yeah, browsers exactly. aren't, uh, aren't filling at the moment. You know? Exactly, exactly. And and of course, um, dare I mention the new kid on the block, uh, Rob Eisenberg's new framework, Aurelia. Right. Uh, now I've been doing a lot of work with Aurelia lately. And I've just got to say, it's absolutely wonderful. You know, it, it's got this built-in sort of automatic detection stuff. I don't know how he does it. I don't know how the team have put it together. All I know is it is fantastic yeah. because it looks at the browser that it's running on and it goes, right, I need this, 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 and this. Oh, right, and, it okay. automatic, and it just pulls them in, it just sideloads them and it, it fills it all in for you, and it doesn't matter which browser your application runs in, you have a more or less level playing field. Nice. nice. Yeah? Well, that, that's good. Now, and that, that's, that's Aurelia framework, is it? Yeah, that's, that's Aurelia. And on top of that, it's got a lot of features in that you only find in compiled languages as well. Um, it does inversion of control. It's got a dependency injector in it. Um it, it, it can auto-locate classes by interface, and you can use it in raw JavaScript and TypeScript. Cool. I think uh, I think there's another show just there in that, I think, uh, that we could come back and, and talk a little bit more I'll, about. I'll, I'll quite happily do a whole set on Aurelia for you. It's yeah. not a problem. Yeah, it'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm actually quite besotted with the framework at the moment, if the truth be known. Sure. It is just, it's made my job so much easier. You wouldn't believe how much easier. Yeah, yeah. You know? oh, good, good. Now we touched on earlier on that uh, HTML5 uh, is uh, probably the death of, of Flash. Um, 
is it is it that good that it that it's going to sort of take over from where Flash was? I know Flash is mainly used for advert uh, advertising now, and uh, yeah, you got um... you got Silverlight as well, which sort of died died a death as well. Uh, and I guess that's partly to do with HTML5 coming in. I I think the only plugin, the only thing that I actually use inside my browser now these days is the Java plugin. And the only reason I use that is because I have some servers and things that have integrated lights out in them. Yeah. And my, my router has a, a built-in control panel, you know, and, and that's delivered as a Java applet into a web page that the device also serves. Sure. You know? So so when I'm troubleshooting and I have to remote reboot one of them, for example, I have to use this Java plugin in order to be able to get a window up on the screen that basically shows me the BIOS level console. But other than that, I cannot think of anything that I do in my regular day-to-day -day work that requires me to have any kind of a plugin anywhere in any of my browsers. Yeah, you know? yeah. I, I was just trying to trying to think what uh, what I use that uses Flash, um, yeah. and I don't know if anything still does. No, I I can't think of anything. I mean. I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. I um, I was out shopping with my better half yesterday and I spotted some nice little black square TV pucks um, for the, on sale in yeah. the local Tesco supermarket. It, what I thought was a, a really nice, reasonable price. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to have me one of them. So I picked it up, chucked it in the basket, brought it home, started hacking around with it and, you know, have a look at setting up a a proper media service for it to stream my movies and things to. Yeah. And I've built a, I've built a Plex media server to right. support this thing. Uh, my intention is that once I've set it all up and put the re requisite apps into it, I'm going to plug it into the TV down in the living room and, you know, we'll, we'll just have a wonderful world of media. Yeah. yeah and, cool. uh, and the Plex media server control panel, is all entirely HTML5. Oh, right. Okay. You know? you're, you're clicking on things, you're adding playlists, and you, the screen's springing to life with live dynamic updates as it searches hard drives and finds files, music and movies and things like that. And it's putting these things onto a grid and then going and fetching the details from the internet and, and giving you little play buttons so that you can do play previews or have a quick listen to the sound, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, yeah. and, and it'll pull down some cover art and it'll go, is this the right film? You know, play the button here, click the play button here. And it, it's doing all this in HTML5. There isn't a single piece of Java, Flash, Silverlight, or anything in there anywhere. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's good. Now, less less dependencies on uh, on things like that than the better. Exactly. Now, on the flip side, um, like many people in the UK, we have a Sky account for Sky TV, yeah. and as part of that account, I have a Sky Go package, and Sky Go are still using Silverlight. Right. For their, for their playback when you log on to the SkyGo yeah, website. Yeah. In fact, if you log on with Chrome, you will actually get a message saying, we are sorry, SkyGo no longer supports Chrome as this browser does not support us. Please use a different browser. Right, okay. Now, to me, that in this day and age, that mm. is very, very unprofessional. Yeah, yeah. You know? that, 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 in my mind, is akin to committing suicide on the web. You yeah. know, but a company the size of um, Sky, well, it probably doesn't make an ape of the difference to them. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. I've, I've not really used Sky Go, to be honest. Um, I think the the other half uses it on a phone now and again, but, uh, but I don't use it very often. Yeah. I use you know, uh, Amazon Prime Video or, or whatever it's called. Things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, I mean, largely speaking, that's... That, that's the status of play with it. In my day-to-day -day work, and, and of course, tools like Icomoon and the various in-browser gradient makers for CSS3 and all that, 
you know? Yeah. They're all HTML5. So, no, I don't think you do still need any kind of plugins, you know? Um, I think, I think with the exception of the adult entertainment industry, um, they possibly are the only ones I've ever seen in recent years that still use things like flash-based video players for their content, you know? Right, right. And, 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 and even, this is all opinion-based. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know firsthand, would you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I might, I might not, you know. Um, for my sins as a web developer, actually, I'm probably one of the few web developers in the UK that will actually undertake work on that kind of website. Yeah. You know? Uh, many, many of many of the people that I work with or that I know in the industry just absolutely won't touch it with a barge pole. Right. Um, right. But, you know, he, he's a little bit of an insight in the web industry. The adult entertainment industry, A, are probably the ones that push most of the envelopes, and B, the ones that have got the most cash to splash out on projects employing freelancers and things. So, yeah. you know. Well, there it's, we go. Uh, There's a tidbit for anybody that's uh, out there looking for a little bit of work. Go and uh, yeah. go and have a look and, and see if those sort of websites are uh, are looking to hire. You know, but um, yeah, I, certainly they are the only ones that I can think off the top of my head that right. still use Silverlight based play. Uh, sorry, Flash based players. Yeah, yeah. You know? and it, it's actually kind of weird that they do because. Most of the advances in the in-browser HTML5 players that have been made and most of the projects that have been submitted to places like GitHub have come about as a product of the adult industry innovating things on the web. Right. right. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you, you've got to sort of think, well, why, why might that be? <laughs> <laughs> you know? JW yeah. Player. JW Player is probably one of the, the most prominent HTML5 video players. Yep. Yeah? That, I believe, I could be wrong on this, but that, I believe, was written by the company that owns Playboy. Oh, right, okay. You know? Yeah. But, you know, I, I digress. We're, we're going a bit off track there, so... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, well, we'll pull it back in. I think we've covered quite a bit of uh, HTML5 there. And, uh, and the, the other topic that, we've, uh, that we're on to talk about is Flexbox. So uh, we'll dive back in, back on the tan, get off the tangents, and uh, with what's Flexbox? So Flexbox is the newest layout engine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, for the benefit of those younger developers who might not understand what I mean by layout engine, HTML has a number of ways that it organizes things on the screen in front of you. And these different ways are handled with different layout engines. Classically, the history of HTML5, or HTML in general, was originally designed to flow, behave, and work in the same way as a magazine layout or magazine-like layout. Yeah? yeah. So when Netscape originally coined things like floats and absolute and relative positioning and all that kind of stuff, and the box model in general, they designed it with the idea in mind that it was going to be magazine publishers that were publishing on the web. They never, ever, ever imagine that we would have applications running on our screens. They never imagined that people would want to take the output that they had in a regular sort of Windows form and emulate that in a browser. So for a very long time, the dominant layout engine was designed with typesetters in mind and magazine editors in mind and it was a very 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 column based engine yeah yeah and and this shows when you look 
a lot of the designs from the mid 90s to the early noughties, you know, um, where you see very, very long pages, but with very, very narrow content. Yeah. You yeah. know, and the content was always two, three columns across. Yeah. You know? Like, like a newspaper deep- and things like that. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly like a newspaper. And, and, and that was because that was the easiest type of layout to achieve with standards the way they were at the time. Now, as we all know, roughly about 2002, Google burst onto the scene with the wonderful Google Maps. And for the first time, people started realizing that, hang on, websites don't have to be about publishing print-like media. We can actually do applications using this platform. Yeah. And I'm sure you can imagine that trying to do the types of layouts that you expect in an average Windows program or even a Mac program or any other GUI based platform using this magazine designed layout and publishing system was a very, very difficult task indeed. Yeah. You know? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, I mean, you, you've just got to look at some of the classic historical examples in the A List Apart archives. Uh, A List Apart in the mid 90s to the early noughties was pretty much the reference site where everybody went. You wanted to know how a hacker left float so that it laid one column out that was exactly this many pixels in relation to another set of pixels elsewhere, you would be pretty much guaranteed to find a hack for it on the A-List Apart website. Yeah. You know? And they keep these archives around if you ever want to go back and have a look back through time. They they kind of have their own version of the Internet Archive project, but but just for their articles. And, and, and some interesting readings in there as well, for especially for the newer developers. You know, it, it, it's an incre- it's an interesting educational journey to see where we've come from. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Now, obviously, this led the What W G group to sit down and start considering. Well, you know what? Maybe we need new layout engines. You know, um, as I mentioned before, HTML5 is kind of like hitting the reset button on the HTML specification. And part of that reset is also a reset the layout engines. And Flexbox is the newest of those layout engines to be added into the spec- specification. As its name suggest, suggests, sorry, it is the flexible box model. And just as its name says, it will adapt itself to fit the display that you're working with. So if you imagine putting a div in the center of your page, oh no, if you imagine putting a div on your page that takes up the whole page space, let's say 100% width, 100% height, and give it something like a 10 pixel border all the way around it, Mm -hmm. then no matter what you set your browser to, that will always take 100% of that space. Right? Makes sense. Now, in order to achieve that, you have to start adding heights and widths to the CSS. Uh, You might have to start putting different rules in for different sizes because... You know what, if you go down to, say, 200 pixels across, 100% of that with a 10-pixel margin might then be a very, very tiny margin and not actually be visible. So you might need to bump it up to, say, 20 pixels, something like that, just so that the the proportions and everything stay in sync. So there's more CSS rules you've got to write. There's more bits of javascript that you might need to automatically detect the screen resize and lots of other things like that what flexbox does is flexbox constantly monitors its container it constantly looks at the screen size and it constantly adapts itself based on what you tell it to do 
And right. the best part about it is you can enable it with one CSS rule. So we're all familiar with the display colon CSS rule. Yep. display block display in line that kind of thing to use flexbox you simply just use display flex right okay and what that then does is that says to the browser's layout engine hey joe this container that you've just set to display flex is now a flexible box parent and this is an important concept to remember because it's not the div that you put the flex display onto that is the flexible boxes it's the content that you put inside of it right right so if you make a container and you set it to display flex it is the immediate children with inside that container that are actually the flex items yeah right and yeah, again yeah. and again depending on how they are set up those flex items will shrink or grow or set their own margins or whatever, usually with nothing more than a couple of CSS tweaks. Yeah. Nice. So, and the other, the other thing about it is as well, is it's not cascading. Um, floats, for example, floats tend to cascade and then you have to do the, the clear fix thing at the end of them yeah, to, yeah turn the floor off and make everything behave normally mm -hmm. again yeah flexbox you don't you put flexbox on the parent you make a flexible container and then only the immediate level children are affected by that only they are the flexible containers anything inside of them is not in any way affected by any of the flex settings on the two containers above it right so, so yeah so, so what that means is you could have, say, a flex parent that is 100% width but with no defined height and set its, con its display type to flex. You could then drop three divs inside of that and you could say, right, first div, you have a fixed width of 300 pixels and a fixed height of 300 pixels. Second div you can use up whatever space is left after the first div has took his chunk and the third div, which I'm going to say you can be fixed to 200 in width, but be as high as you like. Yeah. And what will then happen is you will get a perfectly balanced set of three divs. You'll get the first one will be 300 pixels in width. The last one will be 200 pixels in width and whatever space is left, the one in the middle will take up automatically expanding without setting 100% on it or um, doing any JavaScript hacks to work out the actual maths and that for it. Right. Uh, it, it just it just does it out of the box. It, and, yeah, and so it you've just got, You've got it. no JavaScript and you've got no... Uh... Yeah. No fiddly CSS that you that you spent hours hacking away at to get it to, to lay out. And absolutely. Then, and then when it absolutely. resizes, that it doesn't fit anymore. Yeah, absolutely. And the CSS that you do have to use is something like um, flex colon 0, 0, 0300. Yeah. Yeah. So that flex colon 0, 0, 0300 rule will say to that element, you're not allowed to shrink. That's what the first zero is for. You're not allowed to grow. That's what the second zero is for. And 300 px, that is your defined size. Right. Yeah. Whereas the one in the middle, which is allowed to take up all of the remaining space that is left, you would possibly set it to flex call on one. Now, the absence of the other two values means ignore them. So the flex call on one then says, you know what? You can grow to one times the amount of available space that's left. Yep. Right? If you were then drop another div in between the second div and the third div and say that is flex one as well, what would then happen is both of those divs in that space that's left would equally take up 50% of the space. Right. So, yeah. so that they're... Uh... They're aware of uh, of all their other sibling elements and uh, and they Absolutely. react as, as they need to. Yeah, and what's more, you could then say to the second div, for example, right, you're going to be flex two, but the other one's going to be flex one. 
the one that you've just dropped in. What will then happen is those two elements will divide that remaining space up into three equal parts, and the first one will use two of those parts, and the second one will use one of those parts. Right. Yeah. So yeah. It, if you uh, if you look at that as a as you say there as parts of uh, of its parent area, yeah. That, then uh, that makes that uh, a lot easier to uh, to understand. I think uh, that yep. way around, and it also works in row and column directions. Yeah, so on your container, for example, you can say, right, I'm going to do this. This one across the top is going to be my header. Yeah, yeah? so flex direction is column. Yeah, mm-hmm. column. I, I can never remember which one's which, but. Um, you get the idea. So yeah, yeah. that'll be like flex column. So when you put the divs into it, they will resize according to their rules going from left to right. And then the one underneath, well, this is going to be my page content. And my page content's going to have a sidebar and it's going to have a little mini header above the central content bit and the content's going to flow down, you know? Yeah. So you're then saying something like, right, so the flex direction on this container is row direction. And it'll go from top to bottom. Yeah. And what you can then do, and this is where the really clever stuff with Flexbox comes in. If you imagine that you're going from a desktop display down to a mobile display, these sidebars and things that you might have to the left and the right of your design, you might actually want at the top, middle and bottom to flow down the page in the length direction, as is with most mobile layouts. And using your media breakpoints, you know, the whole sort of if the screen's less than this size, do this, do that, and do the other. Mm -hmm. Using your media breakpoints, you can then change that flex rule to say, you know what, when you're on a desktop, you're doing flex direction column, but when you're on a mobile, you have to do flex direction row when the screen is this wide. And that will automatically reorientate the direction that your flexible boxes are drawn in right yeah so yeah. unlike your traditional stuff where you've just got uh horizontal uh layout and you have to do all sorts of horrible css and javascript hacks to, to get anything to to lay out nicely vertically it's yeah. uh straight out of the box it does uh, <laughs> uh excusing absolutely. the pun there straight out of the box it does it uh, does it both ways horizontally and yeah. vertically yeah, absolutely. And of course, not only can you go horizontally and vertically, you can also do reverse horizontal and reverse vertical. So, so if you that think helps just for other languages. Exactly. So if you think just for a moment there, if you've got an English site and you need to support an Arabic language, which is right to left, you basically just flip the direction of the containers with inside the flex parent and Bob's your uncle. Yeah. And not only can you flip the direction by changing the flex direction on the parent, you can also give each of the children inside an actual order. So by default, everything gets an order of one. So they all jostle for the same level of space, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. But you can, for a specific element, say you are number two and you are number three and you are number four. Yeah. And what they will then do is they will respect the linear order in a descending fashion from the lowest number to the highest. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? And that means that even though, even if you flip left to right, you can still make it so that the sidebar comes before the content or the header comes before the footer. Yeah, Yeah? that's always something that's... uh... Yeah, exactly. as, as as a last last thought, when whenever you make a website, is that oh, this is going to be multilingual, and we didn't consider that uh, we that uh, the the language went from right to left or top to bottom or or something. But uh, with with Flexbox, you change a few settings and uh, and away you away you go, it, it works. Because um, yeah, previously, you probably considered those sort of things for the flow of the text on the screen, but not actually the layout. So, uh, so that's that's a really nice uh, a nice feature, though. Absolutely, and of course, if you tie that in with all the HTML5 stuff you've got, um, the support for right to left languages, things like that, um, there is now built-in support in CSS3 for cursive fonts. 
So you can actually do a similar sort of reversal thing on the uh, the typography itself as well. Right. Okay. You know, you you can say be, because I, I worked on one project where the the used flexbox, and they were really really proud of the fact that they could flip a CSS rule and flip the entire display for a right to left language. Yeah. But it was kind of it looked like somebody had flipped it in a mirror. Right. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean. So the, the, the text still largely read from left to right, yeah. but the left margins were on the right of the display. And with the addition of a couple of extra CSS3 rules and some of the new font support, um, specifically what we did was when we, we detected when the screen had been flipped and we had a custom font tag on the base of the document, which we then just swapped for an acry acrylic. Is it acrylic? Yeah, you know the Arabic sort oh, of... Oh, Cyrillic. Um, Cyrillic, that's yeah. the one. We swapped it for a Cyrillic font that was in the same font family as the base font we were using for the westernized stuff. Yeah. And because that font was designed to run right to left, it had the effect that the text reversed direction properly as well. Oh, nice. Yeah. You know, And it really did look... Very, very professional. Oh, good. Yeah, you know? uh, that's really it, good. That. Yeah, yeah. Well, with a few simple changes, this thing looked as though it had been put together by a multi-million pound development team. Yeah. With lots of designers and lots of developers on that really, really knew what they were doing. But the fact of the matter is, the the team that were doing it were a small startup of four people. Right. Okay. You know. Cool. <laughs> so. so it, yeah, we we touched on there that that had some CSS rules, uh, so, or CSS3 rules. Um, and earlier on, we said that HTML5 and CSS3 were not mutually exclusive. How does Flexbox fit into this? Is it CSS? Is it HTML? Is it its own thing that has so, some sort of relationship, though? So Flexbox is, definitely belongs in the CSS domain. Um, all of the rules for it, um, how you handle it, all goes into your style sheets, you know. Yeah. Uh, there are there is no JavaScript API for it. Okay. Yeah. So if you're changing your flexbox rules, you still have to do them in the old-fashioned way by manipulating the classes that are on the tags. Yeah. Or the 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 style the element dot style dot whatever. Right. Yeah. So like any other CSS style, the particular CSS rule does appear on the style object as a property. Okay. Yeah. So you do have a, a the display property is still there, but can take a string saying flex, just as it would take a string for display or none or block or whatever. Um, and the new things like flex direction and that have their own properties. But what, where it does touch upon the HTML5 side of things, I think, is where with the semantic support. Now, one of the other big things in HTML5 as a whole are semantic tags. Yep. Um, I'm sure, well, I know for a fact that you're absolutely, you are a veteran with, html5 and like well html in general sorry you have probably seen the horrible menu structures built up of divs inside divs inside divs inside ordered lists yeah, yeah. with with class of menu class of menu item sure. class of menu item raw and what's that one that everybody used to use superfish or something you yeah. know I mean, how the hell that big pop-up menu got the name Superfish, I have no <laughs> idea, but <laughs> you, you, you know the type of yeah. stuff that I'm on about. It, yeah, it used yeah, to yeah. give you... I built a jQuery uh, plugin that turned nested uh, unordered lists into into navigation built in a, in a similar way. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and trying to read the output from these things was likely to result in making your eyes bleed or something just as nasty. Oh, yeah. You know? um, well, what semantic HTML seeks to do is 
they've brought new tags into the mix. So, for example, you have a nav tag. Yeah, mm-hmm. you have a a section tag, an article tag, uh, and a side tag. Yeah, yep. and these came about through Google's research. What Google did is round about two thousand eleven. 2010, maybe a bit before, uh, the date escapes me. They did about six months worth of profiling where every browser that visited Google search, when the Google search page was launched, profile, no, no, sorry, it wasn't. Um, What am I on about? I've got that completely wrong. Anybody (laughs) listen to me, please ignore me. I don't know what I'm talking about. (laughs) <laughs> what Google actually did was the, the Google bot search engine that goes and indexes people's pages to do the search ranking. Yeah. They did an analysis of, I think it was 30,000 of the most prominent top websites out there. Yeah. Okay. And they analyzed the structure of the page and they found that in nearly all cases, a navigation bar had a class name of nav. Yep. A sidebar had a class name of sidebar or a side. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, blog posts were always divided into sections and articles, and the the tagline at the bottom saying "published on such and such a time" always had a div in with a class of time or a class of date. Yep. Yeah. So what they did was they used this research to build a list of new tags. And these tags became the foundation for, if you like, being able to look at the code and know instantly, ah, that's a navigation bar. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Now, the astute of you amongst the astute listeners amongst you might be thinking, well, how is that any different to just reading a div and then going, but that has a class name of nav. So we know that's a nav bar. Well, that's easy for you and I as human beings to look at it and go, well, I can see that's a nav bar. But when a computer looks at that, it goes, that's a div with nav on it. Yeah. Yeah. So if you take, for example, a screen reader, a screen reader doesn't really know that that's a navigation bar. It just sees it as a div with a class of nav on it. Nav conveys no meaning whatsoever to it. Yeah? Okay. Whereas a tag called nav does. Yeah. Because this tag forms a compound element that says, I am a navigation bar. I am a section of the document with an article inside of it. Yeah? Mm-hmm. You follow where I'm going with this? Yeah, yeah. So what this what this semantic layout and semantic tag thing does is it gives contextual meaning to the elements within your page. And when used properly, a screen reader can actually read that page and know exactly which bits to read back to the person who's browsing the page and automatically just leave out the rubbish that the person doesn't need to hear. Or more's the point when the person using the screen reader sits there and goes, please tell me what the menu is. The screen reader knows which part of the document is the menu yeah. and where to go look for it. And of course, not only screen readers, but data miners. Right. You know, yeah. we live in an age where we live in an age where data is the virtual currency these days. Yeah. And everybody rips off everybody else's website. Well, I mean, we know that, right? Mm-hmm. It, people don't admit it, but they do. <laughs> and having JavaScript be able to look at a page and go, well, I'll skip over that because that's a navigation. I don't need to, to look at that. All I'm interested in is that there, that section that says it's got data in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, add into that things like micro data where you can say this is a section and then it has various attributes, author equals Peter Shaw, um, date equals whatever, time equals whatever, yeah? Mm-hmm. Then the tag practically describes itself. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you can describe an, uh, an address and whatever. And Flexbox 
works with that because Flexbox also respects the semantic flow of the document. Okay. Yeah? So if you think about this, if you think about the bigger picture of this now and say, right, I have a page and that page is compromised of a number of sections and each of those sections is going to have an article in it. Well, hang on. Doesn't that mean then that your section becomes a flex container and the articles become flex items? Yep. See how it all makes sense now? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Everything flows together and everything largely becomes intelligent, layout agnostic and self-describing. Yeah. So it all it all comes together and uh, it it's where we've been getting to over the last few years, stepping stones. We've got rid of table layouts and uh, it was all div layouts with CSS and floats and things, which made it better for screen readers than, uh, than tables where it didn't know where the cells were. And now this yep. is the next step where the naming of the elements on the page is actually going to tell the screen reader whether that's for um, partially sighted people or, um, or, or, as you were saying, screen scrapers and stuff like that. It, it makes things so much easier. It really does. It's, uh, it's quite impressive and uh, definitely something that uh, we need, need to push forward with. And I think that uh, our listeners would agree now that they can see the benefits of what you've sort of talked about and why all of our browsers need to be up to date and they need to be following this specification. Yeah. Well, at the moment, Flexbox is supported 100% across all the browsers. Right. Yeah. So Flexbox is the least of your worries. If you want to go out there and start using Flexbox right now, you can go out there and start using Flexbox right now. Maxathon supports it. Opera supports it. Chrome supports it. Firefox supports it. IE... Eight, no, sorry, IE9 Plus supports it. Yep. Although, be honest with you, if you're still writing anything in IE11 or less, no. Go home. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Yeah. And don't bother picking your coat up on the way out the door either. No, no, we'll put um, that on eBay. You know, so Edge supports it. You know, so there is good cross browser support for Flexbox in all the modern browsers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, there is another one on the scene that is coming up just behind Flexbox, but that at the moment is still behind a vendor prefix, and that is the grid layout. Right. So if you think back to the conversation we've had here, I mentioned that we've come from a print-style layout to an application-style layout in the browser. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> that's all well and good. That's absolutely brilliant for those of us who were writing web applications. But what about those of us who were still using the browser for its intended purpose and doing print-style media? Mm -hmm. This is where grid layout comes in. Right. So grid layout shares a lot of similarities with Flexbox, but it is designed for the top-to-bottom approach. And what you do is you describe rather than putting rules on a div that says this is a flexible container or this is a flexible child you set up some groups of rules which describe how many columns the page has how many rows the page has and what the gutter in between things are, what the page margins are, what the header margin and the footer margin are, and all that kind of thing. And you describe these layouts in terms, in similar terms to how you would describe the margins and the layout on a, a page in Word, for example. Yep. Yeah. And then what you do when you put your divs together and you're putting your content in, you basically say, right, here is a div or a section, or a header, or a nav, or whatever the hell it is, yeah? Mm -hmm. And the only CSS rule you attach to is a CSS rule that says, this goes in column one, row 10. Yeah? yeah? Mm -hmm. Or column two, row five, or okay. whatever. Yeah. And, yeah. And, it's, and it spans three columns, sure. or it spans one column. So it's very, very reminiscent of the old table-style layout. Yeah, yeah. yeah but it's designed specifically for the print medium kind of thing, which is why it has things like gutter margins and bleed 
bleed and overlay sections and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. But we're not going to get too deep into that because that is still behind the vendor prefixes at the moment. I believe, if I'm right about this, don't quote me on it, I believe that they are looking to ratify it at the end of June sometime. So that's when we should start seeing it come out in an unprefixed model cool. into the browsers. Yeah, yeah. And we're doing a little bit of time shifting here in podcast world, and uh, we're we're uh, coming out with this episode at the start of June. So when when, when you're listening to this, you're not that far away from actually uh, being able to to play with this properly. Yeah, but again, uh, we all know what the standards <laughs> tracks are like and the what WG and the, the zillion other standards bodies that make all this stuff up. So yeah, yeah. Um, my, my advice there with anything that's not quite fully ratified yet, get your bot over to can I use.com and go have a look for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, th- that's where we are with them at the moment, basically. Awesome. Yeah. We covered, uh, covered quite a lot. Uh, in in this episode, um, so just as a as a last thing, if uh, the the users want to go and uh, the users, if the listeners want to go and learn a little bit more about HTML five and Flexbox and CSS three, have you got any specific websites that you would suggest? I know that you said about can I use dot com uh, to check stuff, but uh, any plural site courses or anything like that? Any books? Um... Off the top of my head, no. I mean, if you've got a plural site subscription, I have a HTML5 Photoshop article on there that right. teaches you that teaches you how to take a Photoshop asset and use the slicing tools to make it into a HTML5 ready component, if you like. Yeah. That you can just drop into a container. Um, for a flex box or something like that, you know what I mean? All oh, right. Okay. Um, it, it it's only it, it's just under an hour long. It's not really anything special, but you know, it, it, if you sat there with Photoshop CS six, it'll walk you through drawing a simple menu bar, yeah, and then taking that menu bar and turning it into a series of divs and that. It doesn't use Flexbox because when the video was produced, Flexbox was not available in all the browsers at the time, you know. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah. The the, vi- the videos are a couple of years old now, um, but certainly um, I can't not recommend Plural Site, considering that I'm a Plural Site author. <laughs> yeah. So you know, <clears throat> um, another place where I would strongly suggest looking is Syncfusion. I'm sure everybody knows that Syncfusion is a .NET Tools vendor, but they also have a very nice range of eBooks called the Succinctly eBook series, which are free to download. Uh, all they ask for in return is your email address, so they can they can spam you with a bit of marketing. You know? <laughs> um, but there is now well in excess of a hundred books in the library. Okay. Um, seven of which I've authored myself on different subjects. And I have, I have a book in there on CSS3, which shows you some of the, the, the new shiny stuff that CSS3 does. Uh, I have two books on Bootstrap, and I'm currently in the process of writing one to cover the new Bootstrap 4 that's right, coming out. And, and for those who are looking to use Bootstrap 4, by the way, Bootstrap 4, once it's finally released, will by default use Flexbox and Flex Containers for its column and grid layouts. Right. Yeah. So you you, you know all the, the nice stuff that Bootstrap brought to the table? Yeah. Making it easy to do column and grid layouts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, from 4 onwards, once it's released, it's Flexbox all the way, baby. All right, cool. Yeah. Flexbox, 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 nothing else. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. For those who've had a play around with the alpha, they'll know exactly just how nice this framework's become. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know. well, I like the current um, iteration of it, so uh, I'm sure I'm going to uh, enjoy uh, yeah. version four. So. So, yeah. so. 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 definitely. I mean, the, the succinctly ebooks range, plural site, um, websites. Come to Lidnug and ask you questions. Yep. You know, we're a friendly community. 
Um, I'm in there. There's plenty of others in there, you know. Um, there'll always be somebody who's uh, up to the challenge of answering your questions, you know. But if you do come and ask a question, be prepared to discuss it. <laughs> we're not we're not another stack overflow if you yeah. come and ask a question and say give me code you will be told to go away yeah you know right uh, most of the members are quite intolerant to that kind of approach <laughs> so so be forewarned <laughs> if you're going to come and ask your question be prepared to discuss it and put the work in to to work out the best way to it yeah um you will learn something doing that you know uh on Without a doubt, you will learn, learn something doing that. But they won't do your homework for you. No, no. Um, other than that, dare I say it, Google Developers. Right. Uh, Google Developers is an awesome source of information on everything HTML5. Oh, and Intel. Intel have a very, very good... I don't know if they've still got it online. I can't remember the web address. But Intel had a very, very good online video series taking you through the basics of um, HTML5, right from setting the doc type through to doing complex layouts. But again, it's a couple of years old now, so it probably doesn't cover things like uh, Flexbox and what have you. Sure. You know? But... Yeah, you, the, the usual suspects. Just roam around, Google it, you know? Nice. The, yeah, the, yeah. There's zillions of bits of information out there. Um, and there's just as many people who are willing to impart with that information, you know? Okay. So. <laughs> Great. It's, uh, it's been been informative, and uh, uh, I've definitely got a lot out of this. Um, and I hope that uh, listeners out there in, uh, in listener world have, uh, have got a lot out of it. Um, if you've got any comments um, about it, then get on the uh, Cynical Developer website, drop some some comments on there. Get in touch with Peter through Lidnug as well. Uh, ask him some questions on there, put him through with the uh, through his paces, and uh, see if uh, you can get him to to talk a little bit longer about it and and maybe regret Do you it. Want I think. Me to? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm I'm sure you're gonna put my twitter and all that on the the bio on the website as well so. yeah yeah on the on the yeah. uh show notes for the episode i will include all the links to to the websites that we've talked about i'll put in um peter's details about his uh twitter and um facebook and and everything else that uh, that he has also spoken about so you can get in touch with him then and uh we're just about out of time um, so I'm going to thank Peter for coming on and, and explaining HTML5 and Flexbox for us. You're more than welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks to you guys for uh, for listening. This is The Cynical Developer. I'm James Sturrock, and you've been listening to Peter Shaw talking about HTML5 and Flexbox. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review on your favourite podcast platform and help The Cynical Developer to grow by increasing its audience. If you have any questions about this or any other episode, then drop us an email, a tweet, or leave a comment on the website where you can find all the resource links and show notes for each episode. 